same time, I just realized. John. So John 4 is going to come up. It's already up on the screen. John 4 is page 1066, if you got it, if you got the hard Bibles. We're going to read 42 verses. Is that right? You want us to read all 42 verses? It says this. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go to, through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sica, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, said the woman, you have nof nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. 
Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Great. Um, hello, everybody. It's nice to be uh, together again uh, this Sunday. Um, one thing that's been really lovely with doing this series called Journeying Alongside is that we've had various people, as we've been going through this series, just sharing a story of something that God's done for them as he's been journeying alongside you during the past week. So in a moment, I'm going to create an opportunity for people to share one of their stories. So something, you, there might not be anybody who wants to share a story, but I've had in, instances during this series where people have said to me afterwards, I had a story, I wanted to share my story, and there wasn't the opportunity. So I'm creating the opportunity, okay? And I know sometimes it can feel like it's a bit of a, you know, it, it makes you feel a bit nervous to come up to the front and share a story. But don't feel that. You're with friends. And it's just so encouraging sometimes to hear what God's doing in different people's lives. So to give you a moment to think about if you've got a sh story to share, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes just to go and greet one other person in the room and just bless them uh, because we're here as family today and I think that would be a lovely way to start off what we're doing, especially as we've only had a couple of songs. It still feels like we're still kind of easing ourselves into the service. So why don't you do that? Have a think how um, God's been s what God's been doing in your life this this past week. Okay. Okay, let's come back together. Um, <coughs> it's always the challenge when I give people the chance to go and greet someone. It's always the challenge to kind of bring it back together at the end. Um, but I wonder if there is anyone who's got a story to share, something that God's been doing that you think would be encouraging for people to hear about. We don't have to invent a story. If there isn't anyone, that's fine. We'll just, we'll just get straight into the text. But maybe there is something that God's been doing in your life that you think could really be encouraging for other people to hear about. Um, and if you do have a story like that, it'd be lovely to hear it. It's been wonderful as we've gone through this series to hear a few stories. And I'm going to come back to at least one of the stories that we heard last week as we go through the Bible passage today. Right, everyone's looking blankly at me. You're trying to even remember your week, let alone remember something that God's done for you this week. And that's okay. Maybe we'll just dive into it. Yeah, Eve. Um, 
preaching on Wednesday, I asked you guys to pray for one of our children who we've been having a bit of challenge with. And since then, honestly, it's been so much, so much better. Like, yeah, the things we've been working through, we've just had good time this week. So praise God. Thank you for your prayers. <laughs> that's, that's great. You know, God knows our challenges. He knows the things that are the reality of our daily lives. And he wants to step in to help us. And that's, we're going to see that coming through so clearly from the story today. Okay, well, if there are other stories, we can maybe create an opportunity to share them later or you can share them over tea and coffee. Um, but let's get into this um, story from John chapter 4 um, about Jesus and the well. Now, because it's me doing the story today, not Dan Watson, the well, the well is just... It's just this little bowl of water, okay? Placed str strategically near the electrics. Um, if it were Dan Watson doing the talk, we would have something a bit more ambitious to illustrate the well. Um, but it's got a point to it, which is that I want us to hear today as we go through this story about Jesus and the woman at the well, that Jesus invites us this morning to come to the well to come and find him at the well. And it may be that like the woman in the story, like Jesus in the story as well, actually, you're coming today and you're feeling tired. You're maybe feeling world-weary. Maybe you weren't feeling that at all until I said it, and now it's like, whoa, yeah, actually I am. I am really tired, and yeah, I was up late last night. But... You know, we're going to find as we look at this story, the first thing that happens near, near the beginning of the interaction between Jesus and the woman at the well is they both are coming, tired, weary. And in that place, Jesus speaks a word of renewal and refreshing. Before we get further into that, I just wanted to uh, recap a couple of things that I said at the partners meeting last week about a few things that excite me about New River. Um, I'm not saying that to persuade myself that I'm excited, thinking that the more often I remind myself that I'm excited, that it will stick. This is just, I wanted to just come back to it as we go into this story together. Here's a few things that I love about our church, which I think carry so much potential. Firstly, I think that we as a church share a desire to make whole life disciples, to disciple one another, to live for Jesus, not, not just in a service on a Sunday, but through, throughout our daily lives, using our head, our heart and our hands to worship the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. That, I love that. I absolutely love that. And if I can have a role to play in helping you to do that and you can have a role to play in helping other people in our church to do that, that is good news. I love the fact that our church is seeking to be a family across the generations, across cultures, across ethnicities and, and languages. We're trying to create a space where people can belong where people can know and be known, where we can be vulnerable and real and allow Jesus to transform us, to heal us, to equip us and to send us out. I love the fact that our church has a developing missional connection with, with different groups of people in our local community. with the potential for us as a church to continue to walk alongside somebody else and help them to journey towards Jesus. I think about some of the things that we, we organize to facilitate that in terms of working with teenagers, with football, 
in terms of English classes, in terms of what we're able to do on a Wednesday with, with Food Cycle. But also think about just what you guys do, just in the way that you point towards Jesus in, in, in your everyday lives. This excites me. And then maybe I'm a bit of a church nerd, but I do get excited about developing our resources as a church. Using our resources wisely and support of those, those three things I've mentioned already. I keep asking myself a question, what can we do, Lord, to use this beautiful building to create opportunities for people? It's been so wonderful that we've got that partnership with Food Cycle that's made that possible. But I feel like there's so much further to go in that. And I look around at the group of people who are involved with our church, the group of leaders, the people that are connected in. I just think we've got a really good group here. And I, I find myself saying, Lord, what can we do to help each other to flourish, to grow? What are the opportunities that people want to pursue because God's been putting that on their heart? And in all of that, we found it really helpful, I think, to think about this idea of journeying alongside as a metaphor for what it means to journey alongside one another, to journey alongside Jesus, and to journey alongside those people that we come into contact with in the world around us. And today, the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well it's just a beautiful illustration of this. It's literally a journey, but it's also a journeying alongside that happens in the context of a journey. And um, if we could put the slides up. Today's, um, today's topic, I guess, could be described as the way of grace because it's a way of second chances. This is a journey that creates a second chance for a woman who needs a second chance. She needs a renewal in her life, but also a community. A whole town that needs a second chance. A second chance at life with Jesus in it. And so this kind of plays out. But also, if we know anything, we know that the way of grace is also the way of life that brings the life of the Holy Spirit. The way that brings the life of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? I think many of us, in the time that we've been a Christian, we've come to love the life that the Holy Spirit brings. Sometimes it almost feels intangible what, what, what that life is. But we know it's beautiful. Other times we can be very specific. Some of the changes that God has brought about in lives, whether it's our life or the life of, lives of others, because his spirit has been at work. And here we have a beautiful description of the life-giving um, work of the Holy Spirit coming through the person of Jesus as he goes on this journey. So if you've got questions, if you, if you like me today are at that starting point saying, God, I want to be someone who brings, who catches the life of the Holy Spirit and brings that life of the Holy Spirit with me, regardless of whether you consider yourself to be charismatic or Pentecost or whatever your background is, but you're not entirely sure how to do it. Listen up, because we're going to look at, at, at there's going to be some really helpful things for us to learn from Jesus today. Before Pentecost, Jesus is the bearer of the Spirit. He's the minister of the Spirit. If you remember, John has already described Jesus earlier in his gospel, getting baptized, and the Holy Spirit resting on him. Right at the start of his ministry. And I think that that resting of the Spirit on, on Jesus actually influences him at this point in his decision to go on this journey through Samaria. We'll look at that in a moment. 
But just before we dive into it any further, let's break it down a little bit. Arguably, this is a story that has three parts to it, plus an introduction. The introduction is verses 1 to 6. It puts it in its context, what, what's happening, where they're going, what Jesus is doing. We then have got uh, the first message, first segment, which is Jesus and the Samaritan woman, verses 7 to 15 where Jesus wants to give his renewing spirit to those who ask. In each of these sections, we find some, a, a nugget, a beautiful diamond, a jewel about what is the life-giving work of the Holy Spirit. And the first segment tells us that the Spirit brings renewal in people's lives. Each section also tells us something of the direction of travel. And I've put that on the screen with the arrows. The first section is from God to people. God working his renewal by his spirit in somebody's life. The second section, the second message if you like, takes place still just Jesus and the Samaritan woman, but verses 6, 16 to 26. And the message here is that the Father seeks worshippers in the Spirit, in spirit and in truth. And the direction of travel now is, is going upwards. It's us worshipping God by the work of his Spirit in us. Then the third section, message number three, verses 27 to 42, the field of vision opens up wider. We get the disciples coming along. Then the whole town comes and joins them round this well in Sychar. And the message is that the Spirit empowers disciples to go and reach the lost the arrow, the direction of travel is going out. So you've got that downward arrow, you've got an upward arrow, and then you've got an out. So let's, let's just look into that step by step, these four different sections. Then we'll just create an opportunity as we have some more worship to come to the well, to, to, to come and be with Jesus this morning. And to just let him renew us. To let him shape our worship and send us out this morning. Does that sound good? I hope it does because that's what we're doing. Um, okay. Let's look at the introduction. John 4 verse 4. I don't know if you notice this in your Bible. You'll find it helpful to have the Bible open because we're going to be picking up on particular verses in John chapter 4. <coughs> I, I said when we looked at Jesus and the disciples on the beach at the end of John, that's my favorite passage in the Bible. This is maybe my second most favorite. I just love this story. And if anyone's ever watched the Chosen series, I really recommend going away this week and Google the Chosen, the, Samar the, woman at, the Samaritan woman at the well. It's a lovely drama of this story and it brings out all sorts of other insights <clears throat> anyway look in your bibles john 4 verse 4 now he had to go just you can really overlook it it's like it's hardly there he had to go through samaria jesus another way of translating is jesus absolutely had to go through Samaria. The reason for that, if, if you're into the technical details of it, it's the imperfect continuous ongoing tense. You probably were going to guess that, weren't you? Um, which means that literally he was having to go through Samaria. Let's put a map up. Here we go. Jerusalem over here. Lost the... Uh, over here, he's going to Galilee, up here, 
what Jews would normally do to get from Judea to Galilee is they would come and walk alongside the Jordan River, the valley of the Jordan, River Jordan. And they go up, they go up the hill if they were coming back to Judea. They would go that way round and then they would get to Galilee. Why? Because Samaritans live in Samaria. Samaritans um, were the peoples who, when Israel came back from captivity, there, was al- there were already people there in this land who also charted their ancestry back to Abraham. And that caused all sorts of conflict. They had different ways of worshipping, different ways of doing things. And that conflict led to different people killing each other, which made it get worse. And so over time, this just this hatred grew between Jews and Samaritans. They didn't want to do anything, have anything to do with each other. And when... Jews were traveling down to to the festivals in Jerusalem, there would be occasions where they got attacked by Samaritans. I don't want to say it was just one-way travel. I'm sure there were occasions where Jews attacked Samaritans. But anyway, this is why they would normally go up by the Jordan River. Jesus chooses not to do that. He has to go a different way. He's going here to Sikar. Now, it begs the question, why? Why did Jesus not go the normal route? Why did he go through here? And I want to pose the question today, maybe it's because the Holy Spirit prompted him to go this way because God knew he would meet this anonymous woman at this place and heaven would come to earth. The woman, the townsfolk would come to recognize that Jesus, if you look on the last verse, love it so much. Jesus is the savior of the world. Soter to cosmos saviour of the world I love it you can do a really interesting comparison of this story John chapter 4 Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well with what happened in John chapter 3 Jesus and Nicodemus one is at night one is daytime one is a religious establishment figure One is someone who is an outsider to religion. One of them, not sure they get it. The other one totally gets it. One of them, are they going to follow Jesus? Is still a big question mark. The other one, yeah, sold out, going for Jesus. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that Jesus is putting these two stories side by side and it's getting us thinking, actually, some of the people that we we think are going to be in on this They might sit on the fence. Other people who we don't expect actually are going to come in on it. So this is an unexpected way to reach a woman in a town. What does it teach us about the Holy Spirit? There is such a thing as the compulsion of the Holy Spirit. And it begs the question, are we willing to add a stop on the way? Sometimes you've had that debate when you're going on a long trip on a holiday. Shall we add in a stop? Other occasions, it's just that spontaneous moment where you're like, do I go with this or do I stick with the original plan? Sometimes the Holy Spirit wants us to respond spontaneously to what what is happening around us and go back and change our plan. But are we willing to add a stop on the journey? I thought it was lovely. I think it was last week hearing Isabella sharing her story, a very simple story, where she went to the gym. Do you remember? She went to the gym. She she 
had this hope that in what she was doing, going to the gym, she'd meet people and she'd be able to influence them for Jesus and all these kind of things. She kept going. She was going to the gym and it would just be empty. No one, no one there. I think I've got the story right. And then she, she basically has this woman waving at her and sort of <laughs> it's quite unusual in Britain in, in, a, in a gym. You know, we keep our social distance. You know, you don't do that kind of thing. Waved at her. And she, do you remember Isabella went over? Turned out this woman was from Brazil. They started a connection. They started meeting up. Those are the kind of moments. Sometimes when I'm praying for the church, I just feel that compulsion that I should send a message to someone in the church. It might be a word of encouragement or a scripture. Maybe many years ago you got one of those messages. <laughs> Treasure it. Um, others of you hopefully more recently. But it's just, that's, that's what the Spirit does, isn't it? Okay, let's proceed to the first section. Message number one, verses 7 to 15. Direction of travel, remember, from God to us, to human beings. A section that speaks about the renewal that the Holy Spirit brings. John 4, verse 13 and 14, if you want to look at it, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Just write that out, put it on your fridge at home. Just lovely verses. A couple of things about wells. Seeing as I've made, constructed a well, we may as well big up the well up there. A um, couple of things about wells. First thing is, um, can we think of any other times in the Old Testament where we found wells, things happening in wells, by wells, not literally in wells, that would be worrying. Yeah, what happens with Jacob? Yeah, wells in the Old Testament, they're like discos. Well, like when I was growing up in the 80s, 90s, it's, it's where you meet. It's where the patriarchs seem to, it's the place where they meet their other half, you know, their, their bride to be. So we could think about um, people like Abraham finding his son Isaac's wife, think about Jacob finding his wife. I think that's interesting, isn't it? Because here's a woman who we're going to get told has had seven husbands and the one she's got at the moment isn't her husband. Five. You get to a point, you just like, why, why am I counting anymore? But um, just paying, yeah, checking you're paying attention. Seven's a perfect number. That wouldn't be good, would it? This woman is feeling the pain of that situation. She's feeling the exclusion She's feeling the way that people look at her, which is why she's going to get the water in the middle of the day, probably, in the heat of the day. She's that woman in the community who's had all these husbands. And we don't know what role she's had to play in that and how much of it is a reflection of the fact that in her culture, if a husband wanted to divorce a woman, they could just do it. And then she's got no income, nothing. It's a very precarious position to be in. And I think we have to remember that when we look at this story. Here is a woman, I think, longing for a second chance at life. Complete contrast to those patriarchs. They're at Sikar, which is the land that Jacob gave to Joseph. It's actually the place where Jacob reconciled with Esau. It's just another lovely echo from the Old Testament. People who've fallen out with each other coming back and getting reconciled. Here's a woman on the outside maybe of 
what God's doing and she gets reconciled. She gets reconciled with her community. It's lovely, these echoes that you find, the Old Testament coming through to the New Testament. Second thing about wells, you can have water just standing in a well and it becomes stagnant. It's not the freshest water. And we've got that image contrasted in this story with the streams, the rivers of life that Jesus talks about. You can come to this well, you can, you can have the water that's been standing there for a while. Dan, the hydrologist, will fill you in on how wells work. Or you can have water. I would prefer the water that comes from some fresh stream in Norway or something like that um, for, its, for its freshness and clarity. But here's a couple of the questions I think that get posed in this story. Do we know who is seeking a renewal? Who's looking for a second chance at life? Do we care? Those are the questions that it speaks to me. All right, second, second passage, verses 16 to 26. I'm, s- I'm sorry, we're having to whiz through this. You could do a whole day on this, just all the themes that come out of this story. It's huge themes. But let's move on to the second bit. Verses 16 to 26. The Father seeks worshippers in spirit and in truth. It speaks to me of the revelation of the Holy Spirit. We've thought about the compulsion of the Holy Spirit. We've thought about the renewal of the Holy Spirit. There's also the revelation that the Holy Spirit brings. A revelation about who Jesus really is. When we see who Jesus really is, we worship him, don't we? When we see his love, his mercy, his grace, the way that he goes out of his way to pursue the one that's lost, we can't help but respond by saying, I love you, Jesus. You're the one I want to follow. And that's the, the work of the Holy Spirit. I just want to pose the question to us today. How is the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus to you at this, at this point in time? And don't be afraid if, if you feel like there hasn't been that revelation recently. You felt like God's been distant or you're not entirely sure. You've, you can bring that to the well today. You can bring that to Jesus. John 4 verse 25. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. How does Jesus respond? Verse 26, then Jesus declared, big moment in John's gospel, I, the one speaking to you, I am. Heard that in the Old Testament, I am. I am he. Yahweh, I am. I am aming. Sometimes we're so busy, we just can't see the wood for the trees. Sometimes we're so tired, that every little thing weighs heavily upon us? Or is it just me? So we withdraw and we sink down into our problems. Sometimes what we really need is a moment of letting go and of receiving from the Spirit a fresh revelation of who Jesus is and how he is alongside us. You know that moment where it just feels like everything's getting on top of you and you manage to somehow carve out a little bit of time just to, I like to go for a walk in, in the park or I, I like to get on my bike. Just, just come away with Jesus. It's like I'm coming back to the well. The well of life. And I'm saying, Lord, I need, I need that life again. Maybe that's what God wants you to do today. Maybe it's just that life's been weighing you down. Just come to Jesus today. Let him lift that off you. Then the last bit, third section, you can all go away and you can read it for yourselves later on, but we're just picking up on little verses, nuggets. The Spirit empowers disciples to go and reach the lost. This is the sending of the Holy Spirit. Compulsion, renewal, revelation, sending. 
These are signs that we're full of the Holy Spirit. I think they're better signs than certain other signs people sometimes ask for to, to, to see whether you're full of the Holy Spirit. This last one, the sending of the Holy Spirit. I absolutely love the way that this woman becomes one of the first evangelists, very effective evangelists, in the New Testament. John 4 verse 28, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to, to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Fast forward, verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. The woman had gone to the well in the middle of the day to get away from everyone. You can't help but chuckling at the way she's rushing off to find them and gathering them and sharing Jesus with them. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. How big is our heart for those that need a renewal, a second chance? And who is the Holy Spirit sending us to? As you go off to school this week, as you go off to work, as you meet your neighbours, as you meet with family members, friends, groups that you're part of, I think it's exciting to think that they, the people that are there, they could be someone who's just really seeking a second chance, another chance at life, and you're able just to speak into that and lead them to the well. So just as we s create this time now, I'm going to invite worship team to come back up. As we create this opportunity now to come to Jesus, so I just want you to reflect. Uh, we want to try and be people who um, who just try and listen to the Holy Spirit. I've talked about three different directions of travel, from God to us, his renewal in us, from us to God, our worship of him, and then that sending out, that he sends us out. And it may well be that one of those arrows is what's speaking into your heart this morning. Maybe you need that renewal. There's something in your life that's not working out at the moment. And you just need God to renew it for you. Why don't you bring that to, to Jesus at the well as you respond to him today? It may be that you're asking God for a fresh revelation of who he is. You're struggling in your worship because you're not seeing him. Maybe it's been quite a while since you spent time with him. Bring that to Jesus as you respond today. Or it might be that last one. The thing that's resonating in you today is, Lord, soften my heart. Let me be someone who brings that life-giving work of your spirit wherever I go. What we're going to do, I'm just going to hand out sheets of paper. You might want to, to use these or you might not. You might want to move around and come up to the front, you might not. But what I'm suggesting is just writing down is sometimes helpful in terms of clarifying our thoughts and our heart processes. Just write down why you're coming to the well to be with Jesus today. And then what you can do if you want is you can actually walk up to the front. You can fold it up we're not going to read it. It's anonymous. We're going to shred them at the end. You, c you might just want to put it around where this bowl of water is. And it's your way of saying, Jesus, I'm bringing this to you today. And 
I would encourage you, just spend a moment. Don't come up and then rush back and sit back down. Just spend a moment. Just in your mind, I'm coming to the well to be with Jesus today. And as we do that, the worship team's going to be leading us in worship. You might want to join in singing or you might just want to just be, just be doing this exercise. And if you want to stay where you are, if you don't want to write anything, that's fine. This is just a suggestion. So I'm going to... If you take that outside. Thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord. As we come to the world today, we bring you our heart's requests, Lord. We thank you for the life that your spirit brings. Refresh us, renew us, reveal yourself to us and send us out. In Jesus' name, amen.